This is uh, Deb Sinha. Um, I'm sorry for the folks who uh, tried to get this uh, in real time. I'm um, rebroadcasting the first 10 minutes of the first lecture um, uh, for those who, who care, who might be uh, using Zoom themselves. You, um, when I, at least anyway, start up the YouTube live stream, which is a convenient way to save things, um, it opens up a window with the, uh, with the stream itself. Um, I'm not sure why, because that does get distracting as you're making the stream, but um, I close that, but apparently too early. So I'm gonna just go through the AWW app uh, notes and talk over them a bit as I scroll, and that should let you fill in um, a bit. Um, and the notes themselves are going to be available. I think I'll try to put these together a little bit more sensibly than I have so far. So um, the, the main topic today um, and next time as well, next week, um, are Hopf invariants. And these are um, just concrete ways to measure homotopy. Um, my interest in this actually arose for um, a project in knot theory that I'll hopefully eventually uh, think of, uh, tell you about. But we, um, it's, it's not, uh, it turns out that these um, concrete measures uh, are concrete because they really um, center around the idea of linking. So if you think about linking in, um, in the three sphere, you can co-bound one component of link. Um, we'll call that D inverse and you intersect it with the other. Um, but we'll also see that in this case, this, this geometry of linking is really manifest um, in a quillen functor. And um, at the end of the lecture, we started talking about bar complexes and we didn't get to the full um, quillen functor. That's the quote unquote right one, but, um, but that's where we're going. So what's a, a first example to think about? Suppose we have a map from a four sphere to a wedge of three two spheres. And I take a point away from the base point in each wedge factor, let's call those P, Q, and R. And I'm coloring them blue, red, and green. And I'm assuming some transversality. And, and throughout these lectures, I'll assume a fair amount of transversality. Of course, if you're writing papers, you, you need to check that. But for giving lectures, um, I, will not, I will spare you such details. But this is... Um, assuming it, we don't need to check it in a particular example yet. Um, you look at the pre-images of P, Q, and R, and they will be three surfaces. And what I've drawn in addition is choices of co-boundings. That's what I mean by this um, D inverse of P here is a choice of uh, co-bounding of the surface P. And so that'll be some three-dimensional manifold of boundary. And D inverse Q is going to be some choice of co-bounding of Q. And that's also a um, three-dimensional um, manifold with boundary. And then R itself was a surface. Now, I said three dimensions, but I should really, because um, I'm cohomologically minded, I should be talking co-dimensions. P, Q, and R are each co-dimension two, and that's why their pre-images are co-dimension two and S4. That's a basic uh, Gilliman and Pollock kind of fact. And so then if I co-bound them, that means the co-dimension goes down. So these are things in co-dimensions one, one, and R is in co-dimension two. The whole thing is co-dimension four, so that means it's a discrete set of points in R4, and that means that I can uh, count it. So um, that's what we mean here. We're counting the, the, the intersections. And this is entirely analogous to um, the linking number uh, classically, which Hopf used, which you in this language would just be D inverse P intersect Q for a two component link. And then we wanna think about, well, um, I claim this is, um, is, a, is invariant. So first you have to, to show that it's independent of choice of co-boundings. And well, if you have two co-boundings, um, then if I glue them together, that's a, a manifold without boundary. And then the intersection of, of two of these is ultimately gonna be um, uh, zero when I take a sign count. 
Um, so it's well defined. And then you want to say, well, is it invariant? And the point is that throughout a homotopy um, in S4 across the interval, what you're going to find is that the, um, the co-boundings can intersect other colors. But if this linking number is going to change, then at some point you would either have the, the original red surface or its, its co-bounding cousin, because the things like the genus can change through a cobordism here, um, that red surface would touch the blue surface. But in fact, um, the uh, red surface and the blue surface, they're pre-images of distinct points, so they can't uh, touch. And so these numbers, um, these numbers remain the same throughout the cobordism. Um, so then, um, and then what I want to say is that uh, this will be true, and you can imagine the um, choices in general for 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 wedges of spheres, similar choices, similar iterated co-boundings. You take d inverse of, of everything but one when the uh, one factor when when the um, dimensions are correct, and you get um, an invariant number. So um, you can also formulate this with uh, Durham theory, and you'll see Stokes theorem, not surprisingly, come up in homotopy invariance. So suppose I've got two forms on the three different wedge factors. Um, here by abuse, I'm doing Durham theory, even though it is a wedge of three um, spheres. So it's not a manifold, but um, it's good enough. <laughs> um, and I can uh, pull back omega p and then take um, D inverse of it, and then I can pull back omega q and take D inverse of it, and then finally I can um, uh, take uh, the pullback of omega r, and um, and D inverse in this case is again I've just got a closed two form on S four, it's in a place where there's no cohomology, um, therefore it must co-bound something, and this is uh, this is part of why you call this D is it's an antiderivative. Um, Sullivan mentioned this in his um, seminal paper in rational homotopy theory. Um, so because it's a two form on S4, uh, there is this D inverse and we can play this game and, and um, get these invariant numbers. Here it's invariant by a Stokes theorem argument. So if I've got a homotopy, that's a map on S4 cross I, then if I form the same um, integrand, but with the homotopy pulling back the forms, I can apply Stokes theorem. Then um, you notice if I if I apply D to this expression, I'll get things like H upper star omega P wedge D inverse H upper star omega Q wedge H upper star omega R. But um, omega P and omega R are wedged to zero. Therefore, H upper star omega P wedge H upper star omega R is zero. So because these forms are pairwise uh, um, dis disjoint in their uh, supports, so their, their wedges are pairwise zero, um, D of the integrand is zero, and the Stokes theorem will tell you that the values on the two ends, which would be the Hopf invariance of F and G, if H was a homotopy between F and G, those numbers are the same. Great. Um, that's all I want to say because at this point um, I had started to, uh, well, I sort of restarted the narrative um, talking not only about linking numbers but linking with correction. But if you uh, go to the appropriate next YouTube video and hopefully you did um, find this one first and that one next, um, you will uh, hear that story. That's all I want to say for now.